Okay. All right, awesome. Colleen, uh, thanks for um, joining us today. I sent you all the uh, consent form. So first, did you receive the consent form? I did. And do you consent to having this uh, interview recorded? And we'll be sharing that on the West Schools Can Be Network. I do consent. And then we'll, we might pull out the transcripts to write in, to publish that into the next book. But other than that, we're not going to be sharing it that wise, wise sure. year. Awesome. All right, let's get rolling. So awesome. We're excited tonight to have Colleen Meany joining of uh, Francis Parker Charter Essential School, um, who is the director of the Sizer Teachers Center that is based at the school and actually has an office inside the school that we got to visit in a mm -hmm. fortuitous way uh, a couple of years back, right before COVID hit. Um, and giving a little background, we uh, sort of just popped into a school somewhat just based off of Ted Sizer's reputation, right? Like that is, you know, if Ted Sizer builds a school, it feels like we need to go see it. Um, and so uh, Jason and I had an extra day in the Northeast, and so we popped over. And I think it was way more than we expected. And on several fronts took our breath away. One of those fronts we want to sort of dive more deeply into here tonight in our deep learning details. This is actually session number four of deeper learning details. And so uh, really want to start to dive into the assessment model that is being used. Um, so we're sort of excited to, to jump into it. Um, I will, I think at times, Colleen, share a little bit of screen as we hit on particular topics. Mm -hmm. As everyone, I'll put over in the chat right now, that folks feel free to be sort of clicking around their website as the evening unfolds. Um, and for those that are watching this in, in follow up, uh, it, the website is theparkerschool.org um, because as you're listening to this, it's gonna be helpful to you because they have a lot of their resources and information available, very public about what they do. And so we'll reference some of that as the evening unfolds, but go ahead and start browsing if you are listening along. So, okay, ready to jump into some of the first questions or what did we get wrong about the introduction? No, no, you're on it. You know, just internally, we call ourselves the Parker School. We have a big long name, but it's really the Parker School. <laughs> Yes, good, because th okay. that's a bunch of names in a row. It really is. <laughs> Let's mess one of them up. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, uh, awesome. Okay, great. So um, as we sort of get into this, the thing we're wanting to dive into tonight is, is, a, is a very robust performance assessment model. Um, and it has a lot of different components. Uh, one of the big components we want to look at tonight are the gateways. But before we sort of do look at those gateways, um, performance assessment at the Parker School, maybe a quick summary from your side, and then we can sure. dive of it. I'll do my best haiku. <laughs> um, so performance assessment at Parker is rooted in our criteria for excellence. And this is a lean set of standards uh, that are based on the Massachusetts frameworks um, for curriculum, but they are written as skills and they're much leaner than that um, giant tome of standards. Um, and those things, that, those criteria for excellence that we use with students, um, where we design projects and then assess work on skills such as systems thinking, writing, listening and media analysis, research, uh, mathematical problem solving, scientific investigation, and just a small handful more. But it's a very lean set of standards where we basically asked ourselves, what must students know before they graduate? Know, be able to do, mostly on the be able to do side. Um, so, you know, that, that's the, the sort of ground floor, the basement level of our assessment system is right there. Um, and from that, the school operates by divisions. We're seventh through 12th grade. And when I say division one, two, or three, division one is seventh, eighth grade, division two is nine and 10, and division three, our oldest students, 11th and 12th. 
And as then part of that, you're using that assessment model as the primary model and also giving up some traditional things that sort of make you unique. So you would be giving up the sort of the traditional percentage-based system or the traditional grade, letter grade-based system. Right. I mean, we are giving kids narrative feedback based on their performance against these standards and associated indicators. Um, and, you know, I think what, what makes it different is that a lot of schools break such standards down by these are the standards for seventh, eighth or these are the standards for 9, 10, et cetera. We use the same set of standards seven through 12. And I might've shared this with you, Justin and Jason, but the best analogy I could um, offer would be, everyone knows what the golden rule is, you know, um, treat others as you'd like to be treated. Um, and if you think about the golden rule, when you're three in a sandbox, you know, should you share your stuff? When you're 15, should you plagiarize? When you're 35, should you pay all your taxes or not? Um, the golden rule stays the golden rule. What changes are the challenges to that rule. So we follow that same model where we keep our standards the same. Students in the writing area, for example, will always have to provide evidence for their claims. There's no seventh grade version of that or 10 or 12. It's provide evidence for your claims. We're not going to incrementalize that. Um, what does change over the course of those years is the complexity of the task, the complexity of the problem with which we, or project with, with which we ask students to engage but the standards are exactly the same so students know these standards they're so conversant with them after you know a year and a half it's just they know these and then they age up and they understand those standards even more and just own their learning and have pride in their progress over time so i think i'll go to a, a screen share then to the assessments at parker Hey. Yeah, or even if you click on that one, um, Justin, that says criteria for excellence for just a second. Yeah. Um, and um, so it's still current, even though those dates are, but so go down a, another one or two. Sure. Um, so yeah, if you look at this, we call it um, go back one, uh, LAMA, listening and media analysis. <laughs> um, you know, at the bottom, it says you under process, you generate questions about what you hear and what you see. Okay, that's true whether you're a seventh grader or a 12th grader. So we don't change the standard or incrementalize them. We don't, we don't support that model of like, you do this a little bit, you do this medium, you do it a lot. You know, we're not we're not doing it like that. We're just saying this is the standard. <laughs> this is meeting expectations as you see it here. So then these stay consistent across each of the divisions with yes. three divisions. Gen yeah. Gen yeah, I, I'm hesitant to put the traditional grade levels on them, but there's okay. a division one, two, and three yeah. that range <laughs> between seven and twelve. Mm -hmm. So there are some natural breakpoints in there yep. that you all use, um, but these would stay consistent. So I think there are maybe 15 of these. Uh, this one, Spanish looks like it's running into two pages, so maybe 14 yeah. of these yep. um, that stay consistent. And then are students expected in each division to uh, be able to have a portfolio item speaking to each of them? Yes, exactly. So when we talk about that expression gateway, that's when students move at the Parker School from one division to the next, and they are required to demonstrate their mastery. So they do that in two ways, uh, and they have to do it both ways. One is a portfolio of work, that shows them meeting expectations, as you see on that scale there. Uh, meeting expectations in each of these areas, the 14 areas. 
and the other uh, requirement is a presentation of learning. And those differ and are developmentally appropriate for each division. So for example, at division one, that when students in seventh and eighth grade gateway to the next level or next division, as we say, um, they're required to have a, a cover letter that describes their work over the last two years. Um, they reflect on individual pieces of work through this reflection. Um, they're asked to create a metaphor for their division one experience. What was their learning like over that time? Um, I don't know, it was like a fledging bird <laughs> or what, you know, whatever their metaphor is that's useful to themselves. And they tell the story of their learning in this reflective metaphorical manner. Um, and so at division one, while they're showing some of their work and talking about this, the exhibition of learning is more reflective. And then as you age up and you're in division two and you're finishing division two and you way to the next level, um, that part requires an independent project this time. So you have a portfolio of work showing you're meeting expectations and all the criteria for excellence. And you're doing an independent research project that you present uh, as part of your demonstration of mastery. So you can see that um, there is a reflective component on their time in division two, but that's smaller and they present more on the independent project which exhibits uh, those strength areas among the criteria for excellence. And then the last, the last gateway, so to speak, is really, we don't even call that one gateway, we call it senior project, you know, and that's for grad, toward graduation. Um, a higher standard of performance, of course, more rigorous all year long, um, modeled lightly after a dissertation process. So they have to present their research first at the halfway point of the year, then they get cleared to do some kind of action item or service project or whatever the product is. Colleen, thanks for that. Yeah. For the, just for our listeners to be clear. So mm -hmm. your division, so you have these four divisions and then you have these different criteria for these different um, subject areas. So could a student be in one division in one subject area and in another division in another subject area, or are they staying in that division for all of writing? Yes. So let me say, let me clarify. So let's say, um, for one, this requires me saying that we have integrated subjects. So we teach arts and humanities. So classically, English, history, and the arts together, we call that arts and humanities. Um, we teach math, science, and technology, as it's named, together. We have wellness and Spanish. The whole school takes Spanish. So if you're um, a student at the Parker School, those are your four classes every single day, just those four areas. So uh, let's take um, a 10th grader who is meeting expectations at the beginning of the year in all the areas of the criteria for excellence that go with arts and humanities. If that person is meeting expectations without trouble, they're turning in work on time and they have good work habits, um, they can request to gateway early. So it's the same requirements. Um, and by early, I mean January. Um, we only do gateway opportunities at January and June. This was something when first opened that we did fluidly throughout the year that became untenable. <laughs> so if, if there's a little efficiency offering here, it's do not offer continuous times to move ahead a grade whenever you want. <laughs> so that was a misstep you all made. Yes, for sure. It was for a while. We had to have our hand on that hot stove until we learned better. Uh, so now it's January or June, end of May, June. Um, and that creates good efficiencies in the school and better well-being for leaders and teachers. Uh, 
So you can have a student who say is excelling or, or advancing at a more rapid pace, meeting expectations in the projects, uh, move ahead gateway early, let's say in January out of arts and humanities and into division three arts and humanities, which is with 11th and 12th grade peers. Um, and perhaps a different person needs more time in arts and humanities. And that's the expression we use, taking more time or just need a little more time. Um, just like when I write a grant, I might need a little more time. <laughs> you know, we try to use language that adults would naturally use. Uh, I'm not failing in my grant writing. I just need an extension. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I would never assign myself an F in <laughs> something that I need more time on. I would call it needing more time because that is the fact of the matter. So I love mentality, um, I love that, that, that paradigmatic shift as far as this a real- Yeah, I mean, yeah, that it's part of our oh. internal question we ask ourselves is how would adults say it? Mm -hmm. How would I like it framed? Hmm. And I don't want to be left back. I'm not a failure. I'm not a 60. I'm a good human who's learning at the rate that I can at this point in time. Who needs and more time. Yeah, I just need some more time. So peace and love. Um, so a person might need more time, in which case maybe they stay an extra semester in a division. But they're going ahead in math, science, technology. They're going, you know, carrying on. Uh, in Spanish or wellness, all good. So um, and at and any point in time, about 20, 25% of our population is either taking more time or going, uh, you know, advancing early. So there's definitely some things that I wanna, I love. I think that it's probably that note around there's sort of two big ideas. There is one, like being intentional about language. And I think it is worth noting that we, I feel like you helped to teach us something before we even got on video um, around the word defense, which is extremely popular in this world of performance assessment. And I mean, we're in Kentucky, I'm in Kentucky and, and that word defense gets used a lot, but you didn't react super well to that. And I think it's worth sharing with everyone else sort of how you reacted. Well, I mean, we don't call it a defense. I think of that, that creates, uh, you know, two sides, an offense and a defense. <laughs> and we're not about sides. We're just, you know, there's room for everyone to achieve and I'm not on the other side of students. You know, I'm with them. I'm trying to be an ally to their learning, um, a coach. Um, so we just, we don't think of it as defending. <laughs> we think of it as exhibiting or demonstrating, but we don't posture ourselves uh, in a face-off type of way with kids. There's nothing useful about that at this age or really any age, I, I don't think. So... I'm not a fan of the expression. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't embody what we stand for. I guess is the bottom line. But the fact that you've thought about it, I think, is what comes across. A couple of comments in the chat, right? Like this is a, a depth of thought, and that's one of the things we love about your school is that, as as I've shared with others in the What School Could Be community. Um, most of what we saw on our journey to put the book together was schools in this active innovation mode where they are, they're going fast, they're making mistakes, they're not taking the time to think deeply about each word that's being used in the process. Yeah. You know, you all are at a place where you are thinking deeply and you're, you've slowed down a little bit and simplified and simplifying is actually one of the things I love the most about your approach to performance assessment. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, lean, a lean set of standards, these efficiencies of January and June, um, we spiral the curriculum in a way that lets students um, move in January in a way uh, that helps them meet with success. So for example, um, if we were in a math science class, and we're looking at um, 
I don't know, linear functions, say. Uh, as that the teacher of that class, I might uh, weave linear functions into a project in October, in January, and in May. And I'm doing that on purpose because I know I'm going to get some new students in January and then they would have exposure to that skill. I also know the students who have stayed with me or been with me since September need a second exposure to that skill. And some of them will need a third. Mm -hmm. You know, and a, a really simplistic connection to this is if I asked you, when did you walk? You don't have to answer this, but rhetorically, I'm asking you, when did you walk as a toddler? And walking is developmentally appropriate anywhere from like nine months to 13 months. Does it matter in the end what month you walked? No one, no one cares. It's not on your resume. Maybe I'm the first person who ever asked you only rhetorically. <laughs> but so, you know, we know that if a student needs a little more time, just like a little person learns to walk within a certain range of months, it doesn't matter. But it's on us to keep the door open and give these young people multiple opportunities to repractice that skill, another exposure to that skill. Now, mind you, in the pie chart of skills that I'm trying to expose students to in my math science technology class, that slice of the pie for linear functions might be larger, you know, small, medium, and large. It might not always be the front burner item in a project, but the exposure is still there. Another chance for a brain that's four months older to grab hold and get it. You know, this is the age of one foot firmly in the concrete and the other foot reaching forward toward abstraction. You know, so it's on us to create the opportunities. I love it. Um, I love that language. Yeah, excellent. I want to, I'll just share again for a second, just the, the thought around simplicity. I think for, for me, one of the things that you all do really well is you really do simplify the rubrics um, and sort of contain these sort of rubric areas down to sort of three domains. Mm -hmm. I, I love how simple this is. Like yeah. where the X falls inside of any one category mm -hmm. can, can signal something to a student. And so I love the a very simple model, but it has subtlety to it that I think. Um... Yeah. And again, this is our scale. We, we use those expressions beginning, approaching and meeting. And that's that's really it. There's very few times we put the word exceeds on a rubric. Um, we're just because, again, look, walking. Do you need to exceed at walking? <laughs> You know, you're walking like, yes, you met the standard, like a pretty good walker. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not about exceeds. We're about meet the standard. If you, you know, certainly students sometimes have something very extraordinarily original or insightful or another way to do the problem that hadn't been approached that way before. Absolutely. And we're going to acknowledge that and call it exceeds. But we are not placing exceeds on the rubric that students see. They know that it exists, but it's not something we put out as um, an, an expectation that creates pressure. You so know? Colleen, you, your all's models are, are super simplistic and super clear. Did you all lean on other folks to come up with these models or are they just organically built in house? Or can you walk us through how you all came up with this? Where yeah, at yeah. So one thing is you mentioned Ted Sizer at the outset, um, the founder of the Coalition of Essential Schools out of um, the Annenberg Institute and Brown University. And, um, you know, Ted organized a, a coalition of these essential schools that, that subscribe to these 10 common principles, things like um, less is more, uh, helping students use their minds well, democracy and equity, 
personalization. Um, and schools that chose to uh, aspire to these 10 tenants uh, gathered once a year at something called a fall forum. And it was at that annual gathering, which was national, um, that we both uh, gave and received a lot of ideas. So when you have schools that have shared values, it's there's such a fluidity of idea exchange. So a lot of these schools have senior project, you know, and we all traded ideas about how to make help students meet with success in that. What did incremental check-ins look like? What were too many and what were too few? You know, and kind of striking those balances on different things. Um, it was at the one of the fall forums where we got an idea about flipping our Spanish model where we now have for many years uh, are teaching conversational Spanish first, grammar, writing, and mechanics later. So you think about how did you learn your first language? Did your parents give you a verb sheet? Did you, were you tested on conjugation at the table? Were you corrected with a red pen? No, you were spoken to and loved and softly corrected or someone said it properly back to you. Um, that is how we're instructing Spanish. And kids are picking up more grammar, proper syntax, expanding vocabulary from this approach that everyone already knows from the way they learn their first language. But it was at that fall forum where we got that idea um, from fellow schools in this coalition. So, you know, that that was the big root of who we are and those 10 common principles still represent and comprise our mission statement to this day. We check ourselves on them. We hold ourselves accountable in an August retreat every single year. We focus on one or more and how are we doing and checking in with ourselves, um, getting survey feedback from parents and kids. Um, we hold ourselves to a high bar and we're always aspiring, but um, we hope we're doing well. So along this journey, it's been what, 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Has there been pushback in doing assessments this way or um, concern from any stakeholder groups? I mean, admittedly, we have, we started this way. So we have a big advantage. And one of the reasons why my role exists and our school has this unique feature of a teacher center, you know, sort of professional development arm within the school is because Ted Sizer and our fellow parent founders said, you know, we have a big advantage here. We have a responsibility to the educational community to share what we're doing. Um, and that's where I come in and how I help people who want to learn more about Parker. But um, we've always, parents as Parkers is one of those tenants, excuse me, parents as partners is one of those principles for us. And um, we hold multiple information sessions with families every year for new families and existing families so they can learn about the different features of division one. What does it mean to be you know, the, a new student at Parker and then division two, what's happening in this middle year, how middle years, how are we scaling up expectations? Um, uh, because that's something the school is really good at. We got better at this over time was because we're under one roof, seven through 12. We have these uh, cross grade conversations that are very productive. So we've gotten, we've built that muscle for developmental um, scaffolding that really um, scaffolds rigor in the, you know, a, a really thoughtful way across the divisions. Um, so we work hard to partner with parents to educate them about what we're doing and why we do it. Um, that this has a lot of correspondence, what we do to their working lives. You know, in, I can't think of any working lives where you get a number grade. There's just not a professional equivalent of getting like an 81, <laughs> or I know no one <laughs> who receives such things. So it just doesn't have correspondence to real life. And if it doesn't have correspondence to real life, we probably don't do it. I mean, we're, you know, we're trying to treat students as we would like to be treated, you know, uh, humanely and 
as you know young adults and give them feedback the way you get feedback from a boss you know i hope you get good rich narrative feedback from your boss when your boss needs you to fix something i hope you're not fixing it all the way from scratch mm -hmm. because she probably only told you to strengthen a few areas so you strengthen those areas and then that grant is good to go or that project is you know good to hand off to the next level or whatever it is um so that's what we're doing you know we're not um we're trying to help kids live the way adults live and treat them respectfully so within the building mm -hmm. in the ongoing maintenance of the model yes is there a leadership team like who who are the people that are sort of responsible for maintaining the overall assessment model in the building yeah i mean so this is where we resemble other schools probably a lot you know we have um, a leadership team an instructional leadership team which would be a core tighter circle and then a leadership team that's not just instruction that's a little bit more a, a few more people in it um, but the instructional leadership team are the domain leaders. We use the expression domain because we have blended disciplines. In other schools, that would be called department heads. You know, for us, domain leaders. So leader for arts and humanities, leader for math, science, technology, wellness, and Spanish, uh, special education leader, um, principal, and we have a dean of academics and a dean of students you know so that's our instructional leadership team and they are stewarding our work around instructional goals each year often tied to one of these 10 common principles um, and some other areas that that we're working toward so it sounds like it makes for a pretty tight integration of assessment and the actual projects that are sort of being developed on a, a given year mm -hmm. That one team is covering both both parts of the ground and sort of yearly crafting the experience. Yeah, I mean, I can give an example in math, science, technology, for example, that that domain area wanted to look at. So let me back up. Like many schools, we have some whole school goals, and then we also have some domain based or, or discipline based goals. So math, science, technology was looking at systems thinking. And what does systems thinking look like um, in our projects, seventh grade through 12th? And in that spiral that I described, how are we scaling up the rigor throughout those grades? You know, again, the same criteria, the same indicators, but the nature of the challenge is more complex at each division, harder, harder, harder. Um, but with that same spiral play within the play spiral within the spiral where multiple exposures to the same skills in a year so that those reaching toward abstraction can grab hold at the time that's right for their gray matter development so colleen with this kind of approach how do you think that schooling is different for students using the gateways versus getting a traditional grade, being in traditional classes. Mm -hmm. So how does it feel differently at Parker? So the number one feedback I get from visitors and other people who come see us and meet with our students is, oh my gosh, I can't believe how deeply your students own what they're doing. And all I ask students who meet with people is, is to say, will you take the person through one project, beginning to revision? Because when people visit a class, you see 10 minutes and those 10 minutes could look traditional. You know, I, I don't know what 10 minutes somebody's stopping by, but they don't reveal the arc of a project. And that's the heart of our work is the arc of each of these projects. So the student will tell the story of, um, you know, uh, there's one division one project where students have to make a package a packing material smaller for something. You know, they're looking at waste and sustainability and things like that. Um, 
So they'll show what the package was before, what it was after, what the challenge was, what were the mathematics involved, what was the, the lab report, the sort of science side where they wrote things up and kept a data table, et cetera. Um, so for the student, you know, they're telling the story of their work and they're, they get to this point and say, oh, and then I turned that in and then my teacher gave it back to me with feedback. And then I made these these additions because I didn't have enough evidence or I didn't, my conclusion didn't address this other piece. So I added that, you know, and they're just owning it. <laughs> it's not like they get to the end and it's like 91, whatever 91 means. You know, they get feedback on a rubric with those scales that you showed, Justin, and the indicators from those criteria for excellence, and they know what to fix what to make stronger. And they also feel affirmed in the places where they, they, the teacher is like, great, you know, or this highlighting that part of the rubric, like you, you know, you, your evidence would blew me away or whatever they say. Um, so it's very specific, excuse me, and, and students know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's, there's no mystery. They understand the feedback they're receiving. Um, we have students graduate who are able to talk with adults, who are able to receive feedback without feeling um, defensive, or they ask for feedback. <laughs> you know, they have a mature approach to improving their work. And it's not so much personal. Well, I mean, it's a little bit personal, but they don't take it personally. If you follow me, they want their work to be stronger. And so they think of, they're able to have a little bit of emotional separation from that, that's healthy. It was actually just striking me as you were saying that and comparing it to the 91, which we don't really know what 91 means, is really, correct me if I'm wrong, but looking over, seeing the whole thing, I, there's really nothing numeric or quantitative in the model. Can you think of anything numeric or quantitative in the assessment model at all? No, I mean, in math, science, and technology, we ask students in, the division in the first division, seventh and eighth grade students to graph their performance over time. So that is quantifiable. We're asking students to not only mentally, but, but um, visually notice their growth over time. Um, and it's something we don't ask again, we don't ask them to do it in division two or three, but it's, it's the point is notice your improvement over time. You know, and they you can see these bar graphs that are like smaller, you're just beginning and then it gets better and better and better, you know, and for kids who have a firmer footing in concrete and less abstract reach, they need to see that, you know, so that's a developmental um, move that we make for our youngest students. Wow, um, I, that's, that's, that piece by itself is really worth sharing. I mean, that is a uh... That, I mean, that would help so many educators unlock what's really going on here. Which, I'll send you one, take a picture. Yeah, we um, would love to, to see it because it it is, like, because kids, they're coming to you as seventh graders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they've been coached into this very numeric sort of quantitative thing, right? Yeah. In some ways, you're sort of coaching them back out of it. But in doing that, you're also sort of really showing oh, the rest of us educators like, it's not that this has no relationship. It's not that none of this is quantifiable. It could be quantifiable. Mm -hmm. But the quantifying of it, the numbering of it, is not what's important. It is the sort of deep feedback and the iterative mastery that is what is important. So we really can turn loose of numbers mm -hmm. and then actually produce a better assessment model. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, back to the bigger point of these gateways when students move from one division to the next and they do this performance exhibition um, every project before that is preparing them to do that better just like i said we scaffold skills we also scaffold you know demonstration of mastery they're doing it doing it doing it you know all year for two years and then they have a public one you know that includes family and friends um, and then those, the division one and division two exhibitions prepare students for division three exhibition, which is senior project, which is highly independent. 
you know, so there's all these kind of plays within the plays that undergird and bolster the student to build these skills. So you all are in a unique position because you, I mean, you had the uh, Sizer, um, Sizer Teacher Center, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that you're training your teachers in that center, either um, pre-service and in-service, is that accurate? Um, you know, partly. Yeah, we sat with Ruth, wasn't there? A... Yeah, yeah. So we have a unique um, program at the school, which we are a state sanctioned certification site. So every year we take on about 10 uh, brand new uh, people <laughs> who are not certified, but have a degree in their subject area. And they are partnered with a master teacher uh, who is certified. And at the end of a year, they are fully eligible for certification. You know, they take a, a test here in Massachusetts, um, but they've met the criteria uh, to become certified teachers, but they're mentored all year. It's a full apprentice program, just like other apprentice programs in different fields where you're ex experiencing it, you are doing it. They're on our calendar, not a college calendar. Um, so they're with us from August to June. Uh, they receive a stipend um, for the year. It also creates the opportunity for the school to have in division one and two team teaching. Because we have a person on, I don't know, a third or less of a salary, uh, we can afford team teaching. So um, if Justin and myself, Justin's a history person and I'm the English, and Justin's the new teacher. He has an English degree, but not certification. So I'm a history degreed person with certification. I'm his mentor. I'm counting on him for his knowledge of English literature. Um, he's counting on me for my knowledge of history and pedagogy. And together we uh, fulfill the year. And, and also Justin, you would be working with uh, my colleague Ruth in our new teacher collaborative program, which is this apprenticeship program, meeting with her twice a month, um, full day, one evening. Uh, and she's sort of like your professor on site for the program. So that model probably works out really well with getting these, um, the newbies, getting their head around this whole assessment and how it works and mastering that. So yeah. what kind of advice would you give for schools that that are existing, so not starting from scratch, that want to yeah. start going into more of a performance assessment gateway model. Any, any tips that you might wanna give them? Yeah, um, I wanna say one last thing about these apprentices. Just like a teaching hospital, they keep us honest and, and they ask a lot of questions. So, you know, they're sort of like the, the coral <laughs> backdrop you know, checking us, holding us accountable for what we believe in and what we do. So I really love having them as part of our community. Um, so just closing that off. But regarding um, helping a school who wants to do this, um, my number one idea is definitely get your group together, like Noah's Ark, two of everybody. Um, whoever your, your everybody is, in our case, I'd recommend, you know, a couple of teachers, a couple of students, a couple of board members, a couple of leaders, a couple of parents, um, you know, get your team together. And uh, lots of teams like to set goals right off the bat. I, I disagree with that for this. I think it's better if the team in this, who's interested in this, looks at two things, research, and best practices, then make a goal. <laughs> Let's be informed and then set a goal. Let's don't um, set a goal and um, not know what we're talking about yet. <laughs> you know, I, I really like that idea of learning a little bit first and then naming what you're what you think you might be after. Um, you know, the initial name could be exploratory committee for such and such or whatever, but not much more fine tuning than that. Um, so by research, obviously, I mean, you know, published articles, you know, vetted articles on this type of topic, mastery based um, assessment and performance. By best practice, I mean, um, hearing from schools 
maybe ed leadership type articles or whatever that profile or podcasts like this that profile schools that have this underway and have experience with it and have honed their program. Um, and you know, taking that learning, maybe then developing a goal and then getting out of your setting, go visit places as, as both you, Justin and Jason did. I think you know, that is a brilliant move to go see places. The Parker School during um, the pandemic developed a remote visit protocol. So we have that available for people who can't travel. Um, but doing those visits and then periodically sharing out to the whole staff to the whole parent community, giving them updates so they're part of it and not left on the side while some group advances way far ahead without any inf information sharing. Um, and then, you know, deciding after you've seen this buffet table of both research and real and best practices, what matches your community? What are your community values? Um, what's your cultural context? You know, what works for you? Use some things that you already have. A lot of schools have midterm exam week, final exam week. Sounds like exhibition week to me. <laughs> you know, you have a, a time already carved out, you know, and we do that. We stop school and those are exhibition days, gateway days, you know, about three in January and eight in June, because June is our bigger time for doing it. More kids are ready in June. Um, so it's important. We stop doing other things when we do that. And the other neat thing is kids attend each other's exhibitions. Um, in the senior exhibition or senior project, we require juniors to attend. They must go to them because we say, you're up next year, so go see this. You know, you need to learn about that. So we're doing that at each younger grade level than the one that's up so that they can see you're next. This is what you'll be doing. You're gonna be ready. You know, you have to create that exemplar for students, a hands-on version. Um, but back to those recommendations, you know, getting that committee to, to you know, have good norms and lay out its process that we're going to be learners first design a goal, um, get out there, see some things, visit some places, um, check what we've seen against our own values and what we're trying to achieve. Make sure you know what your students need. Are you looking at student data or student survey, qualitative survey feedback, um, you know, and try to match those. Find out what you stand for. Um, have a shared set of skills. You know, all of our exhibitions are rooted in those criteria for excellence. How are our students, they can't even go do a gateway unless they are meeting expectations on those. We don't let them, they don't have a green light to gateway. And they know this, so that, you know, a lot of kids don't even ask. They won't ask in January if they're not meeting expectations in those areas. So have shared values, have shared skills that you're driving all kids toward these shared skills. Even if it's broad ones at first that are cross-cutting across all disciplines, you know, oral presentation or listening and media analysis or, um, you know, analysis or critical thinking or something like that. Those are ones that go across every discipline can get on board to those. So if you wanted to have some whole school ones like that, that weren't subject specific, that is a way then you want those exhibitions to be tightly um, connected to those. So everyone's always looking for those skills uh, in students. And as kids look across the grades, you know, in most schools, nine to 12, or if you're a middle school, you know, five to eight, whatever it is in your context, and scale up, make sure you're scaling up. Um, what does it look like to be just a little bit more rigorous? And we still support students. Rigor doesn't mean, hey, you know, out of the nest, you're on your own, see ya. <laughs> you know, fly or fall, no. You know, we still have supports built in. Um, and kids, 12th grade, we have a, um, a senior seminar class that is dedicated to students working on their senior project. 
you know, we create that context and that space for them to pursue that. So that's a way of saying this is important. <laughs> So, okay, um, take a few minutes. We've got a few folks in the room and feel free to throw questions in the chat, folks, if you are on your phone on the back deck. But if you wanna pop open and ask a question that is, is welcome to, we've got a superintendent in the room, we've got a teacher from Finland in the room, we've got a leader at the state department level in Montana in the room with us, a uh, development person. So broad spectrum in the room. Uh, so I see somebody asking about interventions. And one thing I'll say about the Parker School is we have um, roughly a comparable number of students entering with IEPs, um, around 20%, which I would call typical um, in you know acro averaging across the United States. Uh, and we have students finishing Parker far fewer using an IEP. You know, they just they don't need it as much. <laughs> You know, this is, we don't have, I should reframe that. We have uh, an abundant approach to achievement. We look at it as abundance and not a scarcity model. You know, we want achievement for everyone. Everyone is meeting these standards. We're really pushing and supporting hard for students to meet standards. So that's, this is what I mean about holding that door open to a skill addressing a skill two, three, four times in a year so that students have multiple exposures to practice. That is something that helps students who are using an IEP to perform at a higher level. Um, they need a little bit more practice or a little bit more time and they receive that. And you know, generally we're seeing kids really excel. Like most schools, we also have academic support. So students can have all the classes they have and have an academic support class, which is um, working with students on skills and real time homework. And, you know, it takes all the formations that it does at most schools uh, with lead people who know our curriculum and instruction really well. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Also, we we'll just throw at that while you read the, there's another one in the chat already. Oh, yeah. That, uh, just putting onto the record, I think that you really benefit from having fewer courses. Things are slower. There's a very robust advising model. We don't have time to unpack the advisory model, yeah. time, but there are a lot of additional supports in place for students that might need a little extra help. Yeah. So uh -huh. one thing about the peer support too, we have in seventh grade, we have a class called seventh seminar, which I would really rename Parker 101 for students. It's like, what does it mean to be at the school? We are a charter school and we serve about 50 communities. So we have kids coming in with all kinds of skills from all different schools. Um, and it's a, a challenge and a blessing in different ways. <laughs> Socially, kids get to start over. They often don't know anyone. So we don't have existing, you know, cliques and groups. We, there's a lot of, um, social emotional equanimity. <laughs> There's, you know, you, you get a kind of a clean slate when you come to Parker, which is really amazing. Um, but seventh seminar has 11th and 12th grade students who come in there and mentor students in this Parker 101 framework. So just like I've talked tonight, we would help students understand what does it mean to receive feedback, narrative feedback, and what does it mean to revise and what happens in advisory <laughs> or um, what's a Socratic seminar or, um, you know, what is narrative feedback that goes to your family look like? Uh, you know, all those kinds of things that help a student understand the school. We have 11th and 12th graders go into uh, our youngest students' advisories and co-lead those, sometimes to a point where the adult steps aside and it's just kid leaders, like a good camp. Right, yeah, I like it. And I was speaking to Sandy's question, the superintendent's question mm -hmm. in the chat around having to reteach some of the old education habits that the seventh graders might be coming in with. Yeah, it's funny, you know who struggles the most at Parker are the kids who had straight A's and no problem. They're like, what? You know, where's my praise? And they, you know, the, the kids who know how to do school, you know, and they kind of, uh, it just comes easy to them. 
you know, but at Parker, they're being asked to think more deeply. They have to revise. They'll get feedback on something that says approaching, approaching, you know, that's new for that student who's used to getting an A or 91 or 95 or something. Um, so in our model where it's seven, eight and nine, 10, uh, you can imagine the first year in that division, students getting feedback that requires more revision. And in the second year of that division, um, hitting the mark a little bit more and less revision. Just like if you're a swimmer and you age up to a new age class. <laughs> um, when you age up, you're kind of the youngest, maybe least strong in your group. But then your second year in that age class, like you're rocking it. Uh, so that's kind of a cycle for us. So another question from Jill in the chat, who is a teacher in Newfoundland, who is uh, questioning around sort of the peer teaching and feedback from teacher to teacher. Now, like most of the deeper learning schools that we interview, there's not a lot of teacher turnover at the Parker School. And so I think there's a pretty solid team. It's been solid for a while. Mm -hmm. Still, they're having to work together. And so how does that sort of peer teaching and learning and mentoring between teachers work? Well, there's the one unique program, which is our apprenticeship program, the new teacher collaborative. So those people do turn over. That's 10 people who turn over deliberately because they're sort of graduating out of Parker and getting jobs. Um, and we wanna keep those spots open for the next flight of folks. Um, but other peer-to-peer -peer pieces are you know, we have a ton of collaboration and all of our curriculum is original work. So we're not um, doing a corporate uh, package of any kind. You know, we design our own work. We definitely confer with different texts or programs or whatever and, and amalgamate uh, to suit our needs along with our criteria for excellence. Um, but it's original work and it's created often by what we call a team of six. In division one, there are six people who teach that division in a domain, arts and humanities, there are six people. So if there are say, I don't know, you know, 10 projects in the year, everybody, each duo is taking on uh, two or three projects and they're uh, responsible for reviewing and revising that project and bringing it back to the team of six saying, oh, our feedback from the last time we did this said we needed more incremental check-ins. So we made this, you know, check-in sheet or um, we, nobody understood this blah, blah concept. I found this amazing video. So we're going to put that in, but it's a team of six. So at Parker, uh, you're not alone. <laughs> you're in a, you know, a very attentive, small community that helps you generate and improve and strengthen curriculum. When you arrive, you, you enter into a platinum curriculum. Um, and so you can be a new person and still shine there. We're interested in your ideas, but you don't have to create something completely from scratch. Um, you get to learn from the good work and, and stewardship on this curricula over the years. So then last question, and we'll wrap on this one. Sure. This whole thing with all this performance assessment and gateway. So what are these graduates leaving with and what do they do next? Do you mean like our 12th graders or at? I think I so. Would, I would think that that's yeah. what, like a you know, traditional uh, transcript. So what do they leave with? Yeah, like, there we go. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think the, some unique features about our graduates is that they are pretty autonomous. They have strong um, skills in knowing themselves as learners and um, kind of working out the kinks of procrastination, which is a feature of almost every young person at some point in time. Uh, they are very conversant with adults. They use professor office hours when they go to college and they don't think twice about it because they're used to you know, narrative and, and just conversational feedback from, from adults. Uh, they're confident presenters. Um, they understand how to form a group on strengths. So I don't wanna be in a group with a person exactly like me. I wanna be in the yin yang and other kind of Olympic ring group where everybody brings something different to the table. They kind of recognize those features of good work that it takes a variety of 
humans to make something strong, not a duplication of similar humans. Um, right, and I, I think they think across disciplines also. Mm -hmm. You well, know, in a in a systems way. They're just not very well rounded, I think, and they're they're well positioned to make that next decision. Most still probably make that next decision to go to college. The vast majority. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have. I think we're you know so we change around ninety five percent going on to college. We have eighty five percent finishing in five years. That compares to the national average, which is only measured on a six year basis, which I think is 59% mm -hmm. um, graduating in six years. So, you know, we have a high completion rate, a high engagement rate with college um, and kids are persevering, you know? So I think that's, it's really important. Our country needs um, well-educated uh, people and we hope we're making a contribution in that direction. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing tonight with us. Um, you know, we're taking a deep dive into the assessment side, but really it's a very strong, very robust school that has been around now for 25 years. This is a solid sort of proven model. They can speak to what happens four years after kids graduate because they've had that data for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's attractive to me as an innovator. And I think many in our community are gonna be attracted to like the how solid this is as um, as a model. And, and Justin, one last thing I have to add is the structures and systems that we have set up um, create more equity than I typically see. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we haven't named that specifically, but it's just been part of everything I've been saying. All the things I've named, you know, keep the door open for everyone to meet with success. Um, we're not, we don't have the same learning gaps or what have you as other peer schools in our region. Um, you know, we just have more students meeting with success. Yes. So that feels really good. And, and I think this is pretty replicable. I'm checking out Sandy, who's, who's there. And Sandy, you can jump in if you want. Sandy, it's got to be cold outside of Kansas City. <laughs> it, well, I just got done with my walk. So I walked while I listened. And oh. I, hey, good I for you. I know I was getting my wellness in, but <laughs> I am so thankful I tuned in tonight because oh. as a superintendent, you have just, it's like my own PD day and I'm like energized to go back to school tomorrow. So um, <laughs> well, just email, I'm putting my email in there okay. if you want to, Perfect. if I can send you anything free. or, yeah. you know, happy to well, help. No, I greatly appreciate it. And I like several things from the language that you used at the beginning to the the team aspect that you set up with parents and um teachers and board members mm -hmm. um i need i did that three years ago but i think it's time for me to circle back around and if you look on our of, calendar on the website we have one of those coming up just join it you know it's for like in oh, okay. parents or something but just put you know it's, it's like zoom or teams keep on giving colleen I, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I got keep it coming, keep it coming. No, um, but no, I am very grateful um, that you did this tonight. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Sandy. Thanks, Sandy. Yes. And Colleen really does run the the Sizer uh, Teachers Center and does co connect on professional development at times, and it is okay. part of the model to share, um, but also you know to share in reasonable prices and stuff like that. So. Um, if there are times when there might be a PD or something that you want uh, to deep dive into assessment, right, do a similar kind of thing, uh, you know, I think that's an opportunity that that lives out there. Yeah, um, we just perfect. had two, two schools visit and come watch one of those team of six meetings where they were mm -hmm. tuning the reconstruction era project. Okay. You know, so people were kind of eavesdropping on what is that the draft look like? How did it get better? What's the, the protocol that we're using with the adults in the space? How does the work get stronger based on that, you know, hour and a half or hour and 10 minutes? Perfect. I wish our state did something. We actually have two new teachers this year that are not educational based, but have a, have taught or have worked in 20 years in the field that they're in. Oh, and wow. it's, like they're going to eventually get it after two or three years, but it's unfortunate that it, 
it takes so long because they're amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, this, what we're doing is kind of an immersion, you know, an immersion thing for, for adults, you know, they have the subject mm -hmm. area degree. We're just trying to help them with the pedagogy. Right. Well, lovely. Thank you for sharing. We could go on, but let's stop there. I appreciate okay. your time, Colleen. You've been so generous thank with you, us. Thank you. I'm answering our phone call on the very first day, which you <laughs> sure. Well, they so, actually technically uh, you called back. We left a message. You're like, there's no way they're going to call back. <laughs> so we were, we're planning other things. And like, just like we're going, we're, we're heading to France Sparker. Nice. So yeah. glad you did. So glad you did. It's been a great okay. Time. Well, everyone be well out there and um, take good care. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye, right all.